Bow with me and pray, please. God of mighty deeds and gentle mercies, we gather to give you praise today. We join with all of creation in uttering our small words of thanks for your steadfast love, which endures forever. May our lives be lived as a song of praise to you, the God of our salvation. Let's sing our prayer as we gather today and turn to hymn number 89 in the Blue Worship Book. You may be seated. As we further prepare our minds and hearts today, I invite you to a time of quiet centering. You can close your eyes if you want, if you feel comfortable. If not, uh, maybe fix your gaze on something. Busy, stressful, long days leave us feeling weary. This quiet space right now, I invite you to center yourselves. Become aware of where you are in the here and now. Right now, maybe those around you. Focus on your breath and experience the stillness. It's easy to let our minds wander to what we have to do later today, or what we hear in the news, or what we've read lately, other negative input or concerns we have on our minds. Today, right now, turn your focus to being here. Today we focus on rejoicing in new patterns of praiseworthy living that reflect the joy of God. Today we elevate our focus.
God, today we confess that we have more golden calves in our lives than we are willing to name. Instead of trust in you, forgive us, Lord, for the many times we substitute trust in you and put trust instead in our money or in things or trust in politics instead of you. Forgive us. God, we confess that instead of what is true and honorable, there are times when we turn our thoughts to the latest news scandal or juicy gossip. Forgive us. Instead of what is just and pure, there are times when we think about the shortcuts we can take to get ahead and the shortcomings of others. Forgive us. Instead of what is pleasing and commendable, there are times when we rehearse negativity, criticisms, and hold grudges. Forgive us. Remind us that you are our God and help us to turn our attention towards you and what is honorable, pure, just, excellent, and worthy of praise. Amen. Now is the time to focus on the children in our church, and I invite the children to come forward for children's story.
All the adults were like, pick me, pick me. <laughs> Everybody wants a snack. Then children can go back to their seats or the nursery where they need to go. All right, it is time for offertory. I invite the ushers to come forward. And um, while they are coming forward, we will pray. Lord, bless these monetary gifts we are about to receive. May it be used through Swan Lake Christian Camp to offer spiritual growth for youth and rest to adults. Amen. Now we'll re be reading the scripture. Um, I'm going to be starting just a little bit before what's in your bulletin. You can follow along with me if you want in your Bible. Philippians 4, 1 through 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you who I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Eudia and I plead with Sintith to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. What is God trying to tell me, Jay? I'm also wondering what my boys were trying to tell me, because there's a toy up here from earlier this morning. In the midst of these communications from other humans and maybe from God or just from the sound man, allow me to pause and pray for a moment. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and our thoughts be acceptable and uplifting in your sight, O Lord, our solid rock and our life-giving redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The passage you have in front of you from the bullet, in the bulletin, and you have an, just an excerpt of, of what Erica read starting in verse 1, is our 2020, 2000, uh, this year's annual meeting congregational focus passage for the year. And actually a portion of it is also on the screen in, in an infographic. I encourage you to at least, even though Erica said you may follow along, I'll, I'll say it more strongly, I encourage you to have it in front of you, whether you're simply sitting with your bulletin facing you or whether you open even better to your own uh, web page with this on or your own book with it on, the Bible. This passage from Philippians 4, 1 to 9, has been a focus for our congregation. Uh, we already had it in a few worship services around Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Day itself, some of the services on either side of that as we entered into Advent, and it was with us at our tables at annual meeting in early December, and the responses over a half hour that the congregation, that those of you present had on this passage were rich. The written responses amounted to four or five pages, single-spaced, long lists, full of high aspirations for our congregation, praises alongside prayers, affirmations of the good and the noble. One of those aspirations named, uh, partly because it's actually named in this passage, but it came up several times in the group responses uh, from the annual meeting, was a desire, a stated desire to, to increase in being a church at prayer, both individually and in groups. And, and this congregation has certainly grown in that significantly. There has been uh, a, a steady monthly prayer time. There has been uh, increasing amounts of resources for prayer in worship services. Philippians 4 includes a call to a certain kind of prayer. Philippians 4, 6 says, uh, basically, in the midst of all circumstances, in every situation, by prayer and petition, speak with God with thanksgiving. In our world, in my own life, in our congregation, it's often easier to bring our prayer concerns, the things that weigh on us, the needs we have. It's easier to remember to pray, oh yeah, when our life is filled with threat or anxiety or distress or loneliness or, or negative feelings, then we remember, oh yes, I can carry these, and truly you can, to God in prayer. It's easy for me to remember to go, as the, the classic, how many of you had the, the high school or college experience of, I forgot to study for my test and now I'm going to pray that God would help me pass it. We know to go to God. We are, we are prompted to go to God when we are in need, sometimes because of our negligence rather than talking with God. We talk to God with our wants, rather than talking with God and listening about God's wants, God's ways. It feels more natural to me, um, especially right now in a world in which there, you can look around and, and, and in various places you look, uh, you can see turmoil or, or, or challenge or lawlessness or, or just change that feels foreign to us, sometimes is foreign to us. 
So it feels more natural to petition God out of our bewilderments, our helplessness, our, sometimes even our righteous anger. And there are certainly passages in Scripture, good examples of distressed prayer. We call them laments. A very large portion of the books of the, 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 the hymn book that is the Psalms are laments. Uh, close to 30% of them, maybe even half, have laments in them. Desperate prayers for desperate and unjust or, or sick times when we ourselves are feeling sick or the world is sick. And Jesus himself has this as part of his prayer life. He, he has something of a lament or a desperation at the, the Garden of Gethsemane. Take this cup from me. He does it again at the cross in even more stark terms. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the state of our world, our church, our national politics, maybe your own health or your own family, it's worth spending some time with cathartic lament to God. How long, O Lord, will you forget us forever? And they're important prayers, especially because I know in, in your lifetimes, it wasn't part of the typical Mennonite spirituality to raise your fist at God, even though... There are tons of scriptures that give us that, that um, pattern. So if it's not something you've done, I'd encourage you to try it out. Uh, read a lament psalm. But today, the prayer that Paul calls for is a different kind of prayer. It's not a lament. It's not in the mindset of need and anxiety. In fact, the central theme, as was, was noted in children's time, the central theme of uh, Philippians 4, the whole, uh, the whole book, really, is about rejoicing and thanksgiving. And so Paul goes into the midst of the heart of our passage for 2020, going, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Do not be anxious, upset, lamenting about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We might expect that this call to not be anxious and come in prayer with a, with a, a prayerful mindset of thankfulness, thanksgiving, would come because the times in Philippi are good. There's a lot of trade happening. There's a lot of rich learning from different cultures. You'd think uh, Paul's, of course, telling them not to be anxious because their future looks good, their present situation looks prosperous. But that's actually not the context of the setting of this church as he writes this letter. The early Philippian church, for all its good assets, is not in a place of placid serenity. They are and will soon become, in, the, in the, cent the, the decades following this letter, a heavily persecuted church. Threats to life from without, from, from the places, the people around them, the, the institutions, the structures, the governments. And not only that, we saw right here in the, the, the verse, uh, verse 2 and 3, that Paul is calling them not to be anxious right in the midst of interpersonal conflict. The church is having a quarrel, or at least two women or two people, Yudia and Sintik, are, are not of the same mind. And he doesn't go into specifics. He actually doesn't lay it on them very thick. Maybe he's being very gracious to them, simply naming it and moving on. But it points to the reality that for the, this church in Philippi, or this set of churches in, in, this, in that city, they are having not just persecution from without, but conflicts from within. They are not of the same mind, unified in Jesus. And it's in this setting that Paul says, don't be anxious. Present your requests to God. Not in anxiety, but in thankfulness. Thanksgivings. Offer your petitions. And the result of this non-anxious mindset that's fostered through thankful prayers and active rejoicing, again I say rejoice, the result is shown in verse 7, and if you do this, I'm adding that word, if you do this, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding and all circumstances, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The very anxiety that we're trying to avoid, we're trying to get ourselves out of, or we're lamenting in our lives, if we lay it aside long enough to go with thanksgiving, then God's peace will protect us from our anxieties, guard our hearts and our minds. The peace of God and later on the God of peace will be with you 
It says above here in, in verse, uh, verse 5, the Lord is near, both near at hand and his, his return is near at hand. So no matter what, what this church, what you all are facing, whether it's simply the inconveniences of life, the, the crummy, cold, blustery weather this morning, I'm surprised actually how many of you are here. Thank you. I know that when the, when the forecast looks bad, many of you call me and say, I won't be there. And I say, it's Tuesday. How have you decided already? <laughs> Sometimes I lament. But... The circumstances of life. You got up this morning perhaps feeling full of vigor in life or, or really needing your coffee. You got up really excited with the family around you or still fighting from the night before. Maybe you got up knowing that you have much life ahead of you or knowing that your days are limited by health or, or simply all of our mortality. Life has inconveniences. Life has reality checks. It has its downs. It has its horrors at times. Cancer, political despair, changes in the church, changes in our own living situations, climate change, the loss of loved ones or conflicts between loved ones, the loss of our strength and our health, depression in a season like winter, divorce. And so in these, these, the times that the world hands us, it's easy to be sour or to fight back or to raise our fists. Or like Yudia and Sintek, it would be easy to go low, hit them in the gut, lament the vices and tell them what for. We're barraged with negativity and outrage and, and dire despair. And, and, and we're encouraged. We see lots of examples of public leaders going low and then lower and then lower. All televised and put on the internet. So should we play on their terms? When things get bad, should we go low? Or maybe should, when things get bad, should Christians, as they do, take the high road, high road, of moral outrage that really isn't a high road because our angry, prophetic voices are still an overfocus on what's ill and what we can do to change it, and what's wrong with public figures, presidents and leaders and society and the world. And it's all reactivity and despair about common vices rather than focusing on lifting your eyes up to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. The church, I lament, spends a lot of time reacting to the ill rather than naming what is good news, the high virtues, and saying this is our high bar. When the lo world goes low, we as the church should ignore it and go high. Focus on the virtues, focus on reconciliation. Just see this situation here. Paul has a situation confronting him in the church, of Philippi, church at Philippi where Yudia and Sintik are fighting, and he could choose to really lay into them, or he could choose to take one of their sides, uh, he, could, he could call them out, but he goes high by simply saying, I hear you're fighting, and I, I pray that you be of the same mind. And then he turns to the rest of the church, or a couple others in the church, and say, would you, my companions, please help them find the same mind in Christ. This week we heard various kinds from various places, vitriol and anger and, and calling out in political speech or sometimes in church life. We, we hear uh, public figures calling and writing about other opponents as evil and stupid and sometimes even at times of prayer. The church is called not to react with the same kinds of name calling, not to go low down in the swamp, but to go high and focus on Jesus calling us to love even our enemies, even when we're persecuted. So looking at Philippians 4, 8 in particular, the, the, the focus verse for this morning out of the focus passage, finally, brothers and sisters, this is where our minds go. In the midst of all circumstances, as you sit, not with anxiety, but with thanksgiving in your prayers and petitions, the peace of God will come around you, transcending all understanding and guarding you. And as you're guarded by the peace of God, finally, brothers and sisters, verse 8, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those kinds of things, the high things, not the low ones. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, think about those things and, and, and then do them. 
Put them into practice. And, he repeats a second time, the God of peace will be with you. In fact, that second promise is even deeper. The first promise in verse 7 was, God's pe the peace of God, peace will be with you. And then the second affirmation is, not only will peace be with you from God, but God himself, who gives you that peace, will be right there with you. The peace of God will be with you, and the God of peace will be with you. If, when, you think on whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, when you think and do these things. In Philippians 4 here, Paul is not simply calling for us to... to take the ills of the world and bury our heads in the sand, pretend they don't exist. Nor is he right, asking us, in some ways actually we've changed the, we've actually changed the words of this song. It's not, um, uh, if you're happy and you know it, uh, your face will surely show it, because sometimes our faces don't show our joy. Um, it, being joyful doesn't simply mean, simply mean putting on a cheerful face. Sometimes because your face is sad, and, and, and dour or, or bland, that's, that's when God's joy that passes the understanding of your situation comes on you. Philippians 4 here is not calling us simply to put a positive spin on things. Well, this situation is really bad, but let me put some positivity into it. No, we should be frank that there are some situations in the world that are crummy, that make us not want to smile, but not forget that that doesn't put an end to our call to rejoice and give thanks. We're reminded that like the light in the world who was not overcome by the darkness, we also, in Christ's power, with his, guarded by his peace, see darkness but are not overcome by it. Instead of stooping to the lowest common denominator of vices and pointing fingers and griping and moaning, of which I am very guilty as a pastor, rather we take God's kingdom approach and step above the fray and focus on the redemptive possibilities, the great virtues that God and God's kingdom have to offer. Whatever is good, praiseworthy, excellent, virtuous, think on these things and do them. The, this list that Paul is giving is very rich. Anytime you have a translation, you have to choose a word. But, but I always find it really interesting to see what other words are added, are, are expand on the meaning of some of these that are here. And as I looked in other translations, in verse 8, you have this whole array from different uh, translations of, of Greek in what some of these words entail. Whatever is true could also be whatever, all the things that are truthful or full of truth or trustworthy, faithful. Things that whatever is noble, that's whatever is honorable or majestic or awe-inspiring or honest or esteemed or, or, or venerable. Whatever is right, those are the things that are just, that are righteous, that are right-related. Whatever is pure, and Jesus is preaching, uh, if you are pure of heart, it means you're single-minded, you're, you're undivided in your focus and your attention. Something that is pure is single-minded, single undivided in, in focus on God and devotion. Whatever is lovely, those are, those are the things that are beautiful. Those are the things that call forth, that elicit the reaction of love in us. Whatever is admirable, those are things that are of good report, that don't give offense to people, that, that are winsome, that win our hearts and our loyalties. Things that are excellent, the word here is, is of moral character. And God knows our world does not display lots of moral character right now. And yet we as a church are called to think on and act out virtuous displays of moral ex excellence, values-based rather than vice-based. Above all, things that bring praise, praiseworthy things that honor God. We as a church could wallow in the sin, and, and during... Lent, which is coming, we will take serious and honest stock of the brokenness in each of our own hearts. But we won't let Lent keep us there. We will focus in, we will not wallow in the swamp in Lent, but name it honestly as Erica did in, in her opening um, um, confession, and then let Jesus move us to the higher ground. Move us out of the swamp to the high places. As a congregation, in 2020, you have a lot of changes coming. 
in your own lives, in the congregation, in the, the world economy, in your pastoral leadership. It could be tempting to, to dwell on the low and difficult things, the anxieties, the uncertainties, the mortality, the, the challenges, the ills of the church or of Freeman or of America or of the world. But instead, I invite you to hear this theme passage from Paul and take your minds, your mindsets, your brains, your guts, and focus them up high. Lift them up. Elevate your vision and your values. Focus at your coffee, table, coffee groups and your Sunday schools and your kitchen tables on, on the values and the visions for the good, not accusations or bemoaning what has gone wrong. In, in church evaluation uh, circles, uh, when, when we do church evaluations, we call this affirmative inquiry. When we name the good things, the assets, the high-minded things, the potential rather than the lack, as you go into this time of transition as a congregation, and specifically in terms of leadership, you'll be tasked, the, the search committee will have to do some honest reflection on who you are as a congregation, what your trends are, what your values are, what, what your best assets are. And it might be tempting for them, for you, to name what's missing, what's deficient. But I hope that you all as a congregation, that the search committee can, can be focused on, on the assets, the possibilities, the things that South Church can celebrate and share with the neighborhood. These higher things to which Paul calls us, the true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent things, are both general virtues and beauty in the world. Paul is using philosophical language here. He's naming that there are some secular things that are of great value. But even more so and above and beyond that, he has the realization that these even secularly beautiful things find their fullest expression of beauty in the higher things of Christ, of Jesus, of the kingdom of God. And so as a church in our worship over the next few months, I will try and make sure that we're, instead of focusing Firstly, on sin and death and alienation and persecution and grudges and violence. Instead, we turn our minds, fix our thoughts on Christ's faithful work of redemption, salvation, new life, reconciliation, forgiveness, mercy. Instead of the focusing in Lent on the, just the rotten flesh fruits in Galatians 5, the envy, the sexual immorality, the divisions, the greed. Instead, we turn our minds, lift them up to higher things, fixing our thoughts on the Holy Spirit's fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, and the like. Instead of over-focus on the fallenness of the world's kingdoms, I commit to help us turn our minds in worship to, not the world, but to God's heavenly upside-down kingdom in which all things are turned right side up. Daily bread is provided. We are delivered from evil. The poor in the morning and the persecuted are blessed. The blind and the lame are healed. The prisoners are released. Widows, orphans, migrants, the forgotten are cared for. Light is given to those in darkness. Sins and debts are forgiven. Dividing walls of hostility between people and between people and God are torn down. Those enemies with God and with one another are reconciled. The lion will lay down with the lamb. Death and tears will be wiped away. And so on and so forth to the glory of God in the highest, in his reign of honor and glory. On these kinds of things, we as the people of God entering into the kingdom of God should think. We think and speak and do good news of the reign of Jesus Christ in our world. And as a result, the peace of God and the God of peace will be with you. So as we continue on in our time of worship and enter into a time of affirmation and prayer, I invite you to think about the sour things that your mind has been stuck on, the low things in the swamp, what has been preoccupying you that you can't let go of. And hear Paul's encouragement to turn your mind, lift your thoughts, fix your gaze on Jesus, his redemption, his kingdom, all that is honorable and right and beautiful and praiseworthy. And think on those things today. In Jesus' name, may it be so. Amen.
I invite you now to turn to page seven or number 713 in your blue hymn worship book. Join with me as I read. We believe in Jesus Christ, who was promised to the people of Israel, who came in the flesh to dwell among us, who announced the coming of the rule of God, who gathered disciples and taught them, who died on the cross to free us from sin, who rose from the dead to give us life and hope, who reigns in heaven at the right hand of God, who comes to judge and bring justice to victory. We believe in God, who raised Jesus from the dead, who created and sustains the universe, who acts to deliver God's people in times of need, who desires everyone everywhere to be saved, who rules over the destinies of people and nations, who continues to love us even when we turn away. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who is in the form of God present in the church, who moves us to faith and obedience, who is the guarantee of our deliverance, who leads us to find God's will in the world, who assists those who are renewed in prayer, who guides us in discernment, who impels us to act together. We believe God has made us a people to invite others to follow Christ, to encourage one another to deeper commitment, to proclaim forgiveness of sins and hope, to reconcile to God through word and deed, to bear witness to the power of love over hate, to proclaim Jesus, the ruler of all, to meet the daily tasks of life with purpose, to suffer joyfully for the cause of right, to the ends of the earth, to the end of the age, to the praise of Christ's glory. 
I now invite you into a time of sharing and prayer. If you have anything you'd like to share, prayer requests, announcements, now is your space. I have a number for you, 194. If you would travel back in time with me to Sunday, May 12, 1963, here at South Church, um, that's how many children you would see in the children's Sunday school department, 194. 20 years ago, it was not unusual to have about 90 children, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, in recent months, we typically have nine children spread out over a broad range of development levels. And this may sound like a lament, but actually, we have the opportunity to share our faith with each one of those children. And if our faith is important to us, which I'm sure it is, um, we will want to share that. So I'd like to um, raise this opportunity as a prayer request. Um, in your bulletin, there's a purple insert. And we have quite a few months of Sundays um, with no teachers at all. And I'd love to invite you to consider this. Um, even though our class sizes are very small, um, we really encourage people to do this with a friend. It uh, can be a good experience for you. It's fun to have another person there with you. This summer, um, I really enjoyed visiting with Donna Lehman as she reflected on how much fun she had teaming up with Cynthia Crable to teach Sunday school. So. Um, Teaching Sunday school can be a blessing for you. And again, each one of these precious children um, are, are just gifts to us. We're glad to have them here. We're glad to see them in our worship service. So please consider that. Um, one other thing, um, there's an announcement um, on the doors and uh, on the back of your bulletin, but I didn't see it on the list for this week. But on Wednesday night, at 6.30, Central Plains is hosting a special event. We'll be connecting with other churches virtually throughout the conference um, for a webinar of sorts. It's a read aloud celebration, so we'll have uh, readers from three different sites uh, reading picture books to kids. So this is for kids of all ages. Come to the church. Um, Bring friends, bring your family. It's just 30 minutes. We'll be focusing on three different books. Um, you'll be able to go home with some activity ideas. And it also gets you um, halfway to earning a free book of your choice um, as part of Shalom Readers Club. That's an optional thing, but there are some beautiful books um, whose value are uh, hardcover books more than $20. So it's kind of fun way to build up your library and learn about um, peaceful and healthy responses to real life everyday situations. So share the word about that as well. Thank you, Carol. Who else? Uh, this morning I received a word that my brother's college friend uh, died early this morning. And uh, so instead of focusing on the loss that he is experiencing, I want to just say that I'm really thankful for college friendships because Steve was uh, Melvin's friend at Heston. They have had a 40-year relationship. Uh, Steve's, uh, when uh, Melvin was pastor in Sioux Falls, Steve and Colette, uh, gave him their family uh, during Thanksgivings and uh, Christmas vacations. And so Steve was like another brother to my, to my brother. And when my dad died, Steve traveled across the country to come to dad's funeral. So 
I just am grateful for the fact that we can have long relationships and then feel grief. Thank you, Lois. Just one more uh, reminder. Today is the final day to get your suggestions for the pastoral search committee. There is still a yellow box on the table in the narthex right behind there for you to put your suggestions in. I'll be collecting those after Sunday school today. Thanks. What others? Who else? If you have something? Good morning. This is Ann Waltner. And um, the service this morning has reminded me of uh, something that I wanted to share with you. Many of you know that I received about a year ago um, a leukemia diagnosis. And uh, my last two um, blood draws, my last two labs, have not been that great. And so nobody is interested in doing anything yet uh, as far as, you know, treatment. But um, it is cause for some concern for me. And um, I'm trying to think of a way to, to deal with this, uh, you know, disappointing news. And one of the things that my sister has recommended, and I think it's a really great idea, is that I'm going to be focusing on the things that my body does well. And I'm going to be focusing on being grateful for all the amazing things our bodies can do. And um, I ask for your thoughts and prayers and your thanksgivings for, um, for my body and for the ways um, that it can uh, do things well. And so I know that this is not something that comes easily for us, but I would encourage you too to celebrate your body and to celebrate the things that your bodies do well. I'll appreciate your prayers for me and our family. Thank you. Thank you for sharing and we'll be praying. And thank you to both you and Lois for, for turning hard situations and pointing us toward the lofty, the things for Thanksgiving. Thank you. Anyone else? Who else? Uh, I do know that this afternoon, this evening, the congregation will have the chance to get together you see in your bulletin today at 6 p.m. Uh, over the next three Sundays, we'll be showing three different films of faith in this worship space on one of these screens. Uh, I think there will be popcorn uh, or some, or, or, or yeah, or water <laughs> uh, as we enjoy these films that, that speak to us about people's faithfulness in the church. Uh, I'll just note that this film tonight is, is highly acclaimed, it's called Of Gods and Men, speaks of uh, a community of, of brothers in Algeria in the 90s uh, during a time of turmoil. Uh, it is, just for your awareness in case you don't read well, uh, it's, it's in French, so if you speak French, great. Uh, if you don't speak French, there are subtitles, and I know as Americans we are not used to films not being in English, but it is well worth your time reading it tonight if you come at 6 p.m. Uh, it is not a family film, though. Uh, there are some intense moments, and so uh, this would not be something for your younger children. Uh, high schoolers, you're more than welcome, though. I encourage you, come and hear this film, watch this film, or come in the following weeks. Let's take these prayers, these sharings. Uh, did you have one? Yeah. Uh, can we take a microphone to, to Ruth? Strasser? Just like Anne, I just want to say, uh, find the good in life and the joys that we have. And many of you have asked uh, from time to time how Dale's doing. And um, we knew going into this journey that, that it would be a tough haul. And um, so we will be um, looking at the next step in treatment. And quite frankly, we don't know what that all involves. Um, Dale has had a test and we'll continue to do more tests and um, and then we'll find out the the plan from there. Uh, pray too, many of you know that we'll be transitioning to Rochester, Minnesota in 2020 and um, along with that transition will come uh, health care and so it's a huge concern for us to be um, working together at both ends 
finishing up work here and also looking forward to the future and how that all ties together. So if you just say a prayer for us to continue to have strength and to lean on Christ, um, that would mean a lot. And again, we don't have many answers at this point. We're just in the discovery um, process. So thank you again for your care. Thank you for being willing to share. Uh, as you'll note in one of the prayer requests in the bulletin, uh, as Anne has shared and Dale and Ruth have shared, there are nearly two dozen people in the congregation right now who are uh, either going through chronic or long-term illnesses and treatments, who have just had surgeries, or who are recovering. Uh, we're in a unique season where many, many of us are, are maybe finding it hard to rejoice, um, finding it easy to be aware of the frailties of our life and our bodies. And so thank you for sharing openly. Thank you for praying willingly for one another, and thank you for offering your words of encouragement and your hugs to one another here in the congregation, because we, we need each other at this moment. So thank you for those of you who shared. Let's go and hold them in prayer, and I will guide us in prayers for those, and prayers in particular as you find on your blue sheet for our children. Join me. Dear God, we lift up our prayers. Um, we, we do so knowing the challenges of life, um, but we also do so in the awareness that we are called by Jesus and echoed by Paul not to be anxious about what tomorrow will hold, what we will wear or eat or how well we will be. And so we raise our prayers and our petitions also doing so with thanksgiving for the many gifts you have given us, the good days of life, the good friendships that, that lead us to a place where grief is possible. Um, we celebrate that our bodies do most of the time, without us knowing it, an incredible amount of good functioning. But we also raise the times when our bodies fall short, when our, our friendships or, or our lives come to an end. We raise up to you the, the, the large handfuls of people in this congregation who are going through health or life transitions. Um, some of them making moves, Jake and Irene in particular this week, as Irene moved to the nursing home uh, as a result of some significant decline or new issues. We also pray for those facing fresh or refreshed diagnoses or, or tests, especially for Anne and for Dale, for others who've been going through the midst of radiation or other treatments uh, during this time. We ask that you, the Good Shepherd, would lead them through the darkest valleys and take them to quiet waters and still pastures. We also pray around the world for uh, aware that our, our, our needs, our hurts, are held and cared for by you, but you also at the same time call us to care for and pray for the suffering around the world. And we are especially mindful of our church brothers and sisters around the world who struggle mightily in the face of, of persecution or oppression. In particular, we think of the the very large church in Nigeria who has had its significant struggle, struggles with Boko Haram and now cannot find refuge in our country. We pray that, with, not with full understanding, how it could be that they are blessed as persecuted people in your kingdom of heaven. We also, in particular, pray for the other kinds of little ones, not just the persecuted and the ill, but the actual small ones in our midst. We acknowledge the, the focus of our prayers in the blue February 2020 prayer sheet, and we will lift those up to you this week and this month, but in this morning we particularly pray for the children themselves. We pray for them by name, those in our care, that they would know the love of Jesus and love him in return. We pray for the very young, for Colt and for Huxley, for Gracie and Kaysen, for Conley and Lydia and Greta and Alice. We thank you for Hudson and Grady and Jace and Luke and Caitlin. We thank you for Rachel and Eli and Landry and Zoe and Rhett and Andrew and Prabha and Emily. We thank you for Jaslyn and Caden and Shad and Henry and Madeline. We pray that they would indeed come to know fully for themselves the love of Jesus and love him in return. And we also lift up our high school youth, many of whom are taking part in catechism together, thinking about the possibility of baptism. We pray for the men there, Seth and Sam and Trayton and Ben and Ben 
and Gabe and Tyler and Gavin and Philip and Bo. Guide their thoughts as they consider taking one more deeper step of commitment to Jesus this spring. We thank you for not the, not the anxiety or the sadness over the decline in numbers, but for the grateful gift we uh, grateful for the gift we have of the children who are and the youth who are here in our midst fill us with the resolve the wisdom to nurture them in faith for all these things for people in need and for people full of rejoicing we give you thanks in Jesus name amen I invite us, as a response to our prayer, as a further affirmation of faith, to turn in your purple hymnals to number 121, uh, Nothing is Lost on the Breath of God. No matter what you're carrying, illness or joy or small or large, God has the capacity and the desire to carry it with you and for you. Let us sing this as an affirmation together as the piano is played. I invite you, against the typical grain of benedictions, to remain seated as a symbol of simply receiving God's rest and care, rather than standing to receive this blessing. May the peace of God, which trans all, un all understanding and all situations, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Go out from here knowing the God of peace is with you.